This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. Talk to me a little bit about when you saw him wrestle. You know, you said you saw it on TV there in Texas. Did you see what era of, of wrestling would that have been? Like what year do you think that would have been if you had to guess? Late sixties. Wow. Okay. Late, yeah, late sixties. Late sixties, and then when he came to Texas, it would have been in the very early seventies. He had a lot of different personas that he tried over the years. Some were bigger hits than others. When when he came through uh, and you saw him in person in Houston, how would you describe his presentation? Oh, it was Pat Patterson and Ray Stevens is the greatest tag team that ever lived. Do you believe the the hype and all that we've heard about their tag team accolades? hundred percent. What made them Nobody so special? Could. You know, it was, they were a team, uh, much like they weren't two individual guys put together. They were a tag team. If you took one away from the other, it's going to sound weird, but if you took one away from the other when they were Pat, Patterson and Stevens, then you didn't, you didn't have the same thing. Both great individual talents in their own right. However, as a tag team, they worked as one. And you didn't really, you really didn't have that a whole lot. Yeah, you had the Infernos, you had the Funks, but the Funks were two individuals. Uh, you had the Von Brauners and, and guys that were just tag team gimmicks, but I don't know if there was any tag team that worked as one as well as Patterson and Stevens that were also great, and I mean great, singles competitors as well. And a lot of that came out of the, the Royce Shire stuff. When Pat was brought in uh, to San Francisco, he was brought in to be Roy Shire's brother. Wow. I didn't know that. So, you know, Pat, Pat had gone from uh, Tony Santos in Boston where he met Mad Dog Vachon, and he knew Mad Dog from Montreal because Mad Dog was a big star there and gone to the Olympics and all this shit. Mad Dog befriended Pat, really liked Pat, and sent him a, a letter saying, you're, you're going to start for, I guess it was Don Owens, but he goes, you're going to start on such and such a date in Portland, Oregon. And Pat's like, okay, how do I get there? He's like, well, you fucking find your way. <laughs> you know, you, you drive your car, you take a plane, you take up whatever the hell it is, get your way there. And Pat didn't know where Portland, Oregon was. And he looked on the map, he saw Portland, Maine. He's like, okay, I could do that. But then Portland, Oregon was completely a whole other side of the world to Pat. And he was scared, didn't know how to get there, and he'd kind of set up shop in Boston. You know, he's like, ah, you know, maybe I'm good here. So Pat had given uh, Mad Dog his word that he would show up, and he didn't. And, and Mad Dog called him and said, hey, I fucking vouched for you. I gave you my word, or I gave the promoter my word that I got a kid. You asked me for help, and I'm helping you. Don't ever fuck me again. Get your ass out to fucking Oregon. So now Pat's like, oh, shit. Pat had, during this time, and I think Pat always knew that he was different. And Pat always knew he wasn't like everybody else. And this was during the time that Pat was discovering that, that he was he was gay. And he met someone, Louis Dondero, uh, that, that became his life partner for the rest of his life. And Louis is like, hey, I've got a car. You know, I, I know what, what we can do. And I'll go out there with you. So Pat and Louis load up the car and they, you know, head to the North Pacific Northwest, man, and set up shop out there. And Pat, upon setting up shop out there, told no one about Louie. That was taboo, man. You, you, you know, in, in those times, what, where are we talking here? Probably 
early, early 60s, maybe late 50s, um, that, you know, Pat's gay. Pat knows he's gay. Pat's got a significant other, and they're living together. But who the hell are you going to tell? And Pat kept that part of his life secret from the business. And he tells a great story about Mad Dog came into the chair, you know, came in. <laughs> I heard this one. And Mad Dog uh, heard about Louie. Well, who, by the way, had, had been with Pat for a while. But again, Pat, it, it, and it's so weird to think about that this was something you, you had to be secretive about. And I'm glad you don't anymore. But he had kept it from Mad Dog, who had gone out and vouched for him and gotten this big gig and sent him halfway around the world or so it felt to go to the other end of the United States. And mad dog comes into the territory and here we go. And so mad dog, you know, tells Pat, and he goes, are you a before? And Pat is like, no, no, no. He goes, you are a poofer. I guess poofer. Yeah, whatever. Another name. And so, um, Pat finally was like, you know what? Fuck you. He goes, I want to meet this Louie. It got to a point. Pat told me this story once at a, at a star cast, uh, where mad dog, or maybe it was, maybe it was, I think it was mad dog. He's so annoyed and he wants to catch him. Right. Yes. That he can tra- tra- chases him all over the city in his car up on the curb. Like yeah. <laughs> I'm going to find him. It's amazing to me that. We're trying to catch, I'm going to catch him with this guy to the point where he's like circling the building that he knows that, that Pat lives in trying to get a glimpse. And when he thinks he might see him literally drives up on the curb, knocks over some tables and chairs. It's re- remarkable. Yes. Cause my God, mad dog was going to find this Louie and, and Louie's running from They're scared to death of mad dog. He's crazy. Right. And finally. Louie's like, fuck it. I mean, if he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. And Louie and Pat and Mad Dog sat down and had dinner. And you are all right for a poofer. <laughs> and they became the, the very, very best of friends. And Mad Dog told Pat, he goes, if you ever have any, anybody ever gives you any problem about Louie, you come to me. Isn't that remarkable that? You know, he had this preconceived notion and hated everything about it. And then actually gets to meet the individuals and realizes, oh, I was way wrong. This was, this was stupid. And we're best friends now. Well, you know, Conrad, I, I, and I've told this story before I, I had the same misconceptions. I I had the same, just fucked up ignorance in, in my head for so long that you know, you know, when, when you don't understand something that is different than what you believe and what you do, you, you don't try to understand it. You're afraid of it for no good reason. What a fucker. It, you gotta do this shit or else you're going to go fucking crazy. We, we, we would leave Vince's house like 1130 at night. All right. It's one particular night. It's 1130. I told Vince this the other day. We were laughing. And we've been there since like 8 in the morning, man. And it's a Saturday. And we just, we're done. We're done at this point. You're 15 hours in. I'm done. So we would stand in the courtyard at Vince's house getting into our cars. He's like, Brucey, where are we going to go? I got to get a drink. Oh, my God. I need a fucking vodka. And I was like, okay, we'll, we'll eat, get something. But where? Because it's 1130 at night. Not everybody's going to be s- still serving that late. Vince walks out and goes, hey, guys, what, what are you doing? Ah, you going to go get a pop? And uh, hey, hang on. I'll, I'll go get my shit. No, <laughs> no. We're getting away from you. Just stay here. So we go to this place, uh, Giovanni's in up on High Ridge in in Stanford, and the the old man ran it. Giovanni uh, 
was there at the door. Place is closed, but he knows us. And he's like, come on in. I'll get you guys a couple porterhouses, baked potato and uh, salad. And just sit, sit in the bar, just whatever you want. Just uh, I'll leave the one girl here for you. She'll get you all your drinks. Take your time, whatever you want. So being one of those incredibly just fucked up days, man, we sat there and Pat's drinking vodka tana and I'm pounding beers. And then I switched to vodka because he's drinking vodka. And Pat's telling me stories. He's telling me stories he probably shouldn't have been telling me. But in it, you know, it was Pat really opening up to me. And and just, uh, you know, we got really, really personal. I guess there was a point in the story that I got a look on my face and Patrick looks at me and he tilts his head a little bit and he reaches over and grabs my hand. And he says, Brucey, Brucey, it's okay. You're not my type. And in this moment, I'm a little bit hurt. Sure. Cause how, how you think you're, can I not be his type? You think you're a damn good looking man. I get it. I'm a fucking damn good looking man and a good catch. Who okay. wouldn't want me? All right. And, uh, yeah, and there, there were just great moments like that. <laughs> we would fucking, and then we would just start laughing on and just kind of go off, off from there. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, Pat was all about making people laugh and having fun. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.